This is Lindsay Science School. Brought to you by Craig Swap and Associates. Hi everybody, I am Miss Lindsay and this is my science school. Today we're talking about something really fun. We're talking about how thunderstorms form. Now we get thunderstorms in the summer and maybe you've had some questions about those thunderstorms and how they form. If you think of a question while you're watching this video and you're watching it on our Facebook Live page on KUTV's pa Facebook page, go to the comment section and you can ask us a question and we'll get to as many questions as we can at the very end. For right now, let's learn a little something about thunderstorms. Now the first ingredient that you need to make a thunderstorm is warm air. We don't get thunderstorms very often in the winter, right? And that's because winter is cold. You need to have a warm, moist air mass to make a thunderstorm. If you remember back to a previous science school lesson, we talked about how warm air can hold more moisture than cold air can. So we need a warm, moist air mass. The second thing that we need to make a thunderstorm is we've got to get that warm, moist air to lift so that we can get some condensation happening, right? Because you've got to have clouds, that thunderstorm cloud, in order to get a big old thunderstorm. So one of the ways that you can get this warm, moist air to lift is if you get cold air moving in. Now remember when we talked about density, we talked about how cold things, cold air, is more dense then warm air, and so that cold air sinks. So it moves underneath the warm air and it pushes that warm, moist air up. And when you push that warm, moist air up, that's when you can get that condensation and you can get that thunderstorm that forms. Now, how do we get a thunderstorm to grow? We have a little thunderstorm that's just begun here, but we want it to continue. We want it to get bigger. So in order to get it to grow and become a bigger thunderstorm, we need to have a couple of things happen. First of all, we need that warm, moist air to continue feeding up into the thunderstorm. We call that an updraft. And the reason we call it an updraft is because that air is moving up into the thunderstorm. While you've got that warm, moist air moving into the thunderstorm, up higher in the atmosphere, we're gonna get dry air that pushes into the thunderstorm. Now that dry air is important because when you start mixing dry air into a warm, moist thunderstorm, you actually start to evaporate part of the thunderstorm. Well, why would we want the thunderstorm to start evaporating, some of those water molecules in the thunderstorm to start evaporating? Well, something cool happens when you get evaporation happening. The air around it starts to cool. Did you know that? That when you evaporate that moisture, it starts to cool. And what happens with cool air? It's more dense than the, than the air around it. And so it starts to sink. We call that sinking air a downdraft. Have you ever noticed how when a thunderstorm moves over your house, it's probably really warm ahead of the thunderstorm, but then the thunderstorm moves overhead and it rains on you and suddenly the temperature gets cooler. It can get 10 to 20 degrees cooler after a thunderstorm moves through and that's because of that downdraft, that cold air sinking down from inside the thunderstorm. And as long as this continues where you have that warm, moist updraft and that cold, dry downdraft circulating inside that thunderstorm, it will continue to grow and expand and become a bigger thunderstorm. So that's the key. You want that warm, moist air continuing to rise within the thunderstorm and the cold air sinking. Let's go over to the science desk now. Mr. Ron is with me helping me today and we are going to do an experiment about updrafts and downdrafts. We're going to make our own little thunderstorm, right. Mr. Ron. I love thunderstorms. I love thunderstorms too. I love to watch them in the summertime, yes. go out on the front porch yep. as long as lightning isn't striking around. That's right? true. That's yeah. true. If there's lightning, you want to go indoors. <laughs> yeah. They are really fun. So to make our own thunderstorm today, we just need four different things. We need a clear container and it works best if that clear container is about the size of a shoebox. So that's the closest one that I could find in my house. We want to fill that clear container with warm water. So we've got warm water in there. That sort of acts as our warm air mass. 
We talked about how we need warm air in order to get these thunderstorms to form. The next thing you need is red food coloring, and that's just to see the water moving around a little bit. And we want blue ice cubes. And the reason we've colored them blue is because they're going to symbolize the downdraft that happens. So the red's gonna symbolize the updraft happening, that warm air rising, and then the blue is going to symbolize that cold, dry downdraft. So this is a pretty simple experiment, yeah. not hard to do at all. It takes a little bit of prep work making those blue ice cubes, but once you have everything ready, it's pretty easy. So the first thing you're gonna do, Ron, is take maybe four of those blue ice cubes out of our ice cube tray, and I want you to put them on the right side of that uh, container there. Okay, he's ready to pop I've, yep, out. Yep, I've already, I've already cracked okay. it for you, so you're good to oh, go. Oh yeah. yeah, so four. Yeah, I put four of them in. Just drop them in on the far right side. Okay. Good. Good. One more. Yep, and you might need to push them back over okay. to the right side. Yep, there we go. We want those to stay on the right side. Now I want you to take your red food coloring and drop just a few drops into the left side. Maybe do two or three drops of red. Okay, good. Now we just sit and watch what happens. So do you see how the blue ice cubes are starting to melt? And what's right. happening with that blue water as compared to the red water? Do you see what's happening there, Ron? That's right, the red is starting to take over the blue. Well, the red is going over the top of right. the blue. So from the front, you can see it a little bit better. See how that blue is sinking down, that's our downdraft, and then our updraft is going up and over that cold water. So that's what's going on there is we've got that, that circulation going on, the warm, moist air going up and then that cold air sinking down. That's what cool. we need. We need that mixture of those two different air masses, the warm, moist air mass and the cold, dry air mass to circulate within that thunderstorm. Or you can see it really good now. Yeah. You see that blue on the bottom and the red on the top? Yeah, the blue's just sinking down. And, yep. Yeah, and that's because the warmer air, or in this case water, the warmer water is less dense than that cold water that we created through our blue ice cubes. So that cold water is sinking down to the bottom. So we've made our own little thunderstorm. That is awesome. So how do you get hail out of this? Oh, now? we're going to be talking about hail in an upcoming episode. Oh. And also next time we're talking about lightning and thunder, because you know that with thunderstorms, you get that lightning and that thunder. So we'll be talking about that next time as well. Uh, oh. Right now, let's answer any questions that we might have about thunderstorms and how they form and grow. I think you've got your phone ready to go. I've got my go. phone here. Let's see what we've got. See if we've got any questions from anyone. As a reminder, you can ask those questions on our Facebook page. Go to the KUTV 2 News Facebook page. There's our little theme music right there, too. And you can ask a question in the comments, and we'll get to as many as we can. And because this was such an easy experiment, yeah. we've actually got a lot of time to answer those questions. And uh, since we're in school, I put these on, oh, so I look smarter you than do I really look smarter. am. Your IQ's gone up by at least 20 <laughs> points just by putting those on. And that's big on. for me. <laughs> Okay, everybody right now is just saying uh, hi, good okay. morning, and uh, yeah, good morning to you too. Okay, good morning to all of you guys. We're so happy that you're tuning in to learn more about thunderstorms and those warm, moist updrafts and the cold downdrafts. And yeah, again, if you've got any questions, throw them in there. You can also throw in your child's name, their age, their school, and we will answer any questions they might have. Maybe nobody has questions about thunderstorms. Uh, you were so clear. I, I, I mean, explained you answered it so every question well. there is, yeah, right? You know it. You know it. Okay. Aaron asks, how does lightning start? Okay. Well, that's what we're going to be talking about next time on Thursday, but I'll give you a brief little explanation right now. Within your thunderstorm cloud, you've got little rain droplets. You also have uh, little snowflakes and you can even have hail as Ron mentioned a moment ago. Well, all of those little rain and, and snow molecules and the, the hail, they run into each other. And as they run into each other, you actually get electrons 
changing position with each other. You can get a little bit of an electric charge. Well, the atmosphere doesn't like to be out of balance. We've talked about that in a previous uh, science school lesson as well, about how the atmosphere is always trying to equalize itself out. So it wants to do the same thing with charge. If it's got a negative charge here and a positive charge over here, it wants to equal out those charges. And so it does that through a lightning bolt. And we'll go a little more in depth about that coming up on Thursday's Science okay. School. Holly has a good question. Do our mountains inhibit any thunderstorms? The Midwest seems to have the larger ones. They even do. Produce tornadoes. They do yeah. have the larger ones. And the reason that they have the larger thunderstorms out to the east is because they have more warm, moist air than we have. We are in a desert, right? And so we don't get a lot of really juicy air masses up here. They do over in the Great Plains and in the Deep South. They're right by the Gulf of Mexico. It's a very warm ocean. And so they have a lot of very warm, moist air available to them to get those bigger thunderstorms. We just don't have that moisture source. And that's why we tend to not get huge thunderstorms like they get back east. However, as far as the mountains are concerned, the mountains can actually help produce thunderstorms. We talked about how that warm, moist air has to lift. Well, guess what? If an air mass is moving up and over mountains, what happens? It has to lift to, to get over that mountain. Yeah. And so the, thun the, the mountains can actually help us produce thunderstorms. They just den generally don't tend to be as big as the thunderstorms back east because we don't have as much moisture in the atmosphere. Okay, Luke is eight years old and he asks, can you predict a thunderstorm. We can predict thunderstorms. Yep. Now, can we predict that it's going to pop up right over your exact neighborhood? Mm, nope, we're not that good yet. But we can say in this general area, maybe the northern Wasatch Front, places like Ogden, Farmington, Brigham City, you have a really good chance of thunderstorms today. But if you go a little bit farther south, down to Provo and Sandy, maybe your thunderstorm chance isn't as great. So we can predict them with pretty good certainty for an area, a, a, a larger area. But as far as predicting at your house, whether or not you're going to see one of those thunderstorms, that's still a little bit trickier. But we are still learning about the atmosphere every single day. So maybe when you guys grow up and you're adults, we might at that point really be able to pinpoint exactly where those thunderstorms are going to pop up. Right now, it's generally just an area that we can say has a pretty good chance of seeing those thunderstorms. Yeah, we've had uh, questions about lightning. That seems to be on yeah. top of everyone's okay. mind. Uh, well, Jim asks, how long do thunderstorms last? I Ooh. guess what, what would determine how yeah. long they last? They can last as long as that updraft and that downdraft continue. As long as we have that circulation continuing, as we did here in our uh, science experiment, as long as we've got that good circulation of warm, moist air feeding the thunderstorm, and then that cold, drier air exiting the thunderstorm, it can just continue and continue and continue. So generally what you'll see is you'll see thunderstorms little individual thunderstorms lasting for maybe an hour or two at the most, then they'll die off, but they'll generate new thunderstorms. And so a line of thunderstorms can continue for days working their way across the United States. Is there a particular month in Utah where we have more thunderstorms than any yes. other? That's my question. Yeah, July and August is our thunderstorm season here in Utah. And the reason that July and August are our thunderstorm season is because that's what we call monsoon season. A monsoon is where you get a shifting of the winds. In July and August, we tend to get winds from the south. And when we get winds from the south, that can pull up that warm, moist air that we need from off the coast of Mexico. If you've ever been lucky enough to go to Mexico, it is so warm down there, especially right along the west coast of Mexico. It's very warm, very moist. So when we get to pull that warm, moist air up into Utah in July and August, that's when we have the best chance for thunderstorms. Ethan wants to know why do clouds turn dark mm. and black? Okay, they turn dark and black when they are so heavy with water inside them. The reason that they appear black is because they're blocking out so much of the sunlight. That sunlight can't make it through the cloud because there is so much water in the cloud. And that's why thunderstorm clouds appear to be so dark because they're so heavy with the water that wants to come out and rain all over your backyard. 
What about a rainbow when the thunderstorm is over? Oh, yeah, that happens because of refraction. That's something we should do a whole lesson on yeah. is how rainbows are formed. But yeah, when you're in between the sun and a rainstorm, that's when you can see a rainbow. And it's because that sunlight goes through the raindrops, is refracted. That means it breaks that light up into the rainbow because inside that light, that white light that comes from the sun is all the colors of the rainbow. So as that light shoots through a raindrop, it gets broken up into the different colors of the rainbow and that's why you see a rainbow. So in order to see a rainbow, you gotta be in between the sun on one side and the rainstorm on the other. But we should do one on that. That would be yeah, that's really, a great really idea. fun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. Well, Kenny, uh, how do we often do we get thunderstorms during the summer? We've already talked about that one. We uh, can get them every single afternoon as long as that warm, moist air is in place. Right. Yeah. Uh, Mia, eight years old, she wants to know how rain forms. You, you've done that one we, before. We have done that. We've talked yeah. about the water cycle. Remember, you've got to evaporate all of that water vapor, and as it rises, it cools and then condensation happens. That's when you get clouds forming. Now, eventually, when so much condensation happens that the, the cloud just can't hold that water anymore, that's when you get rain or precipitation. So that's how rain forms. Paige wants us to talk about a tsunami. Oh, a tsunami. Yeah. That's not weather related, no, but that's, that's related earthquake to related. earthquakes. Yeah. We learned about earthquakes a few weeks ago. Tsunamis happen when earthquakes occur underneath the ocean floor. We talked about those different kinds of earthquakes. You can have ones where the plates slide apart, one where the plates slide on top of each other. When you get one of those, happening underneath the ocean floor where one plate gets forced up on top of the other, now you force that water up that was sitting on top of that plate, on top of the, uh, on top of the Earth's crust. So you force that plate up, you force the water up, and as that water moves towards shore, that's when you can get a tsunami, or it's also called a tidal wave. So we could actually do a science yeah. school on that as well. Misty asks, is it possible for tornadoes to hit Utah? Well, we've seen that happen before, yeah, not very often. It doesn't happen very yeah. often. In fact, on average, we only get two to three tornadoes per year here in Utah, and they're usually very small baby tornadoes. Now, we have had some pretty decent ones, like the one that happened in August of 1999. That was a very powerful one. It worked its way right through downtown Salt Lake City. We had another just a few years ago in Ogden as well that was a pretty decent one. So they can happen here in Utah. They just don't happen very often because our mountains tend to protect us. And that's a good thing. That is a good thing. <laughs> we will take those mountains protecting us. I hope you enjoyed this lesson on thunderstorms, how thunderstorms form and how they grow to become big thunderstorms. Thank you to Mr. Ron for helping me today. Thank you very much. I've learned a lot. Good. I'm glad. I love coming to class. <laughs> even though I only get a C minus average here. Well, that's pushing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, coming up next time on Thursday at 930, we're talking about something that happens from thunderstorms. We're talking about lightning and thunder. We've got a couple of lessons for you to do. Experiment one, you need a balloon and a light bulb. Now a fluorescent bulb will work best, but if you don't have a fluorescent bulb, it's okay to use a regular light bulb as well. You might, it just might not work quite as well, but it will work. Experiment number two, you need a paper bag, like a lunch bag that you would take your lunch to school in those brown paper bags, a flashlight and a stopwatch. And that's really more of a game than an experiment that you can play with your siblings or your parents at home. So we'll see you on Thursday at 9.30 a.m. on the KUTV Facebook page and KUTV.com. Don't be tardy.